Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to the second of our panel sessions. Um, we are going to be discussing in this very exciting debate uh, what Labour should be prioritising um, as they prepare and gear up for the, the next election, and also possibly what their priorities should be if they do win, you know, what they should be thinking about uh, in their first term, their first 100 days, and etc. So with me, I've got Lord Kennedy, who is the opposition chief whip of the House of Lords. He's been in this role since 2021, I believe, and he's also had the opportunity of working under the leaderships of you know, Jeremy Corbyn and also Ed Miliband. I've also got to my right, I have uh, Kirsty McNeil, who is the parliamentary candidate for Midlothian. It's a seat currently held by the SNP, but I believe Labour is expected to win that at the next election, so that'll be quite fun. Um, we've also got Patrick English, who is uh, working at YouGov. Uh, he's renowned for his work on exit polling, I believe, on a number of broadcasters. And also we have got Emma Burnell from the Fabian Society. She's also a playwright and a political commentator. So we're going to kick off with uh, some short remarks from Lord Kennedy. You're welcome to go to the podium. Thank you very much. I'm delighted uh, to be here today. And as you said, my name is Roy Kennedy. I'm the opposition chief whip in the House of Lords. And um, I've been a member of the House of Lords um, since 2010. And um, I've also been the housing spokesperson and the home affairs spokesperson. Um, first and foremost, I'm a Labour Party member. I've been a member of the Labour Party 45 years. And I don't look old enough, but I, I am I've, uh, a member 45 years now. And, um, I'm also the treasurer of the Fabian Society, and um, um, Labour's been in my blood, really. You know, I come from a Labour family. And um, for me, Labour is the best vehicle to actually improve people's lives in this country, actually, and actually around the world. And um, we've shown that in our periods of office. The frustrating thing, of course, I think, for us is that we've spent so many years out of office. And that's, in some ways, the most frustrating thing that uh, I think you know, frustrates us all that for all, for all the great things you've done in office, most of their history has actually been out of office, in opposition, saying what we would do if we were in power. And I think we need to maybe, with the next Labour government, maybe start to change that as a, as a way forward, actually have a sustained period of office again. We've, I've been out of office now, as you know, just over 13 years, and it'd be good to get back uh, and win the election this year. And I hope we can win. But it is very much a possibility we may win, but equally we could lose. And I said we're very good at losing. Um, but we have not a single vote has been cast yet in the, in the election, not a single vote. And already people are actually, you know, talking about Labour landslides. And uh, I saw the stuff in the Daily Telegraph, you know, and I'll be looking for here, if, if, here in, you know, in a moment from uh, Patrick about polls and stuff, because, uh, you know, it's great to be in the lead in polls. It's wonderful, isn't it? But I'm also wanting to hear about the methodology of the polls, how actually accurate they are, and actually how realistic it is. Because for me, a poll is a snapshot of what could be a result in an election if it was held at that particular time, and no more than that, and just an indicator of where we could go. Now, this um, session, I think it's entitled Winning and Governing. And it's certainly time for our Labour government, it's time for change, and time to put our programme into action. But um, I spoke to a um, former colleague. I used to work for the Labour. I worked for the Labour for 21 years in a variety of roles. And uh, I spoke to a, a colleague yesterday, and they said, we were doing this um, uh, event for staff, talking about how, how, as a member of staff, you know, um, you would organise visits, campaign visits. And we showed a video. And then you popped up in it. Uh, and it was about some of the visits that were, got, were done in the 97 election, and of course you were then in the East Midlands, and up you popped, uh, organising the visit. And, uh, and they go, that is, that's, that's Roy Kennedy. I, I, I had red hair then, a few pounds lighter, and I had glasses, so it didn't look quite look like me. Um, but it, it just showed, you know, all the enthusiasm we had at that visit. And I'd come forward 26 years, and what I remember coming on the train uh, this morning was, what, what actually happened then? I remembered our absolutely, you know, pivotal twinning strategy. 
You know, if anyone was involved in those electoral, those campaigns, you know, how if you either worked in your key seat, you were in the key seat, you worked in the key seat next by, and, that's, and you didn't go anywhere else. Absolutely key it was. I remember Gordon Brown, his determination about being, the, you know, how he'd run the economy as Chancellor. Because, of course, again, often, of course, they take a view that Labour is, uh, there are lots of lovely people, great ideas, but can you trust them with the economy, with your money? And he absolutely clearly was there how he would do that. I remember the vision from Tony Blair setting out Labour's agenda for, uh, for the future. And those are absolutely clear, clear things for us. And I also remember John Prescott, and he used to talk to colleagues. He'd say, do you remember that old Labour Party logo? The one with the kind of torch, the quill and the shovel. Do you remember that? Yeah. And then he would say, we need a bit less pen and a bit more shovel. Of course, and I was absolutely right, because actually it's hard work winning elections. Hard work. We actually need to get out there, knock on those doors, deliver those leaflets, and actually get on there and actually deliver and do the job we all need to be done. Because as I said before, Labour in government has done some wonderful things and actually made people's lives better here and abroad. But we do absolutely nothing when we sit there in opposition. And I think the um, less pen, more shovel is important today as it was when John said it 20 odd years ago, and actually also when that logo was invented just uh, before the war. Now, I said lots of speculation about polls, uh, not a single vote yet being cast. I said, nice to be in the lead, but I think, you know, what we've got to do is actually win that election. And it's getting our proposals right, our manifesto right, our pledges right, communicating them, and also to ensure we actually win all the seats we need to win. Now, when Labour won the election in 1997, we had a 10.2% swing. It was a record, a record win for Labour. We, I think we'll people Patrick confirm, I think we need 12.7 uh, this time. So another record to beat. I think it's also fair to say, when we had that 10.2% um, swing, you know, that was a record at the time. But since the Second World War, there's only been one thing election. We've got more than 6% swing for a winning party. So these are mountains to climb, absolute mountains to climb. And we, we need to do that. Um, it's also really important we win seats in each part of the Great Britain. Really important we win in Scotland. We need to have Kirsty back as the Member of Parliament for Midlothian. Absolutely vital we return, you know, dozens and dozens and, you know, members back for Scotland. It's, we cannot win elections without having a, a, a big representation in Scotland. And I heard the latest nonsense of Hamza Youssef when he's going around there saying, Labour doesn't need to win a single seat in Scotland, they can win it all in England. It's absolute rubbish. He knows that, but what he also knows is he needs to keep a Tory government in Westminster because with a Labour government in Westminster, of course, the case of independence actually it, it goes out the window, and he knows that. So that's the, and if you look at what's been going on in Scotland in recent years, and Chris knows much better than me, it's an utter disgrace. And we saw the stuff recently with the COVID inquiry, and, you know, I, and all these WhatsApp messages will be deleted by we don't know how. I know how to delete a WhatsApp message. I'm sure you will do as well, but it's um, no, it all just they just vanish up there. So it's really important to win seats in Scotland. And we just cannot be, and be clear in the SNP, they're not a bunch of cuddly lefties who actually, they're the same as us, just they just want to be independent. They're not. They're not a bunch of cuddly lefties. I'm sure Kurt are most far better than me. And my friend George Fouts and the Lords makes it clear every single day. We need the SNP out of Scotland and the Tories out of Westminster. Now, we... Um, we also, of course, have said, you know, so this, this session is about winning and governing. And I think they got the, it right. We've got to win the election first. The governing comes second. So win the election, we have to win the trust, win the right to put your programme into action, and with the right policies, we can actually do that, actually change our country. But, but winning become, is the first issue. Um, and things like... Things we project, like our pledge on dentistry, have been really popular in the, in the last couple of weeks. They're the things we can actually do and make a real difference to people's lives. Now, I've never served in a government. I've been in the House of Lords now. I'll be 14 years in May. Opposition is absolutely awful. You can say what you're going to do, but you actually can't do anything. You get a few wins here and there, but it is awful. And um, I, I also saw a little bit of, you know, 
at first hand when I was in working for the, the party, what you actually do, but it's awful. Now, what I've observed in those 14 years, and it's got, it's got worse every year actually, how as Chief Whip, and I've been Chief Whip now for a couple of years, my best, best ally for winning votes in the Lords is the government. Not because of their policies, actually, isn't it? The, bit, the, the best bit about them is they just do it so badly. It's a, it's a lack of respect for the House, a lack of respect for the processes. Um, everything is transformative, everything's brilliant. Um, papers don't, don't turn up on time. Um, they don't produce reports as required. They just mess around all the time. So every time you go to win a vote, because they've wound everybody up, in fact, they have so little respect for Parliament, so little respect for processes, so little respect for how you treat both Houses of Parliament, it makes the job of winning actually much, much easier. And to win the Lords, I need to get 50 or 60 crossbenchers in with the Labour group. And it's actually largely easy because of the way they've operated. And if I'm lucky, if we're lucky enough to win the election, and if I'm lucky enough to be appointed the government chief whip, my pledge is that I'm going to do it properly. We're actually going to not going to be losing votes because I can't be bothered to get the papers there on time. You know, we can't be bothered to have you treat the House. Because so I think, actually, if you, if you treat the place with respect, work within the convention, the rules, a lot of your problems can go away, and then you can just discuss the politics and the issue in hand, which is the more important thing. And if you, and you, and you and we, we will lose votes, so I'm sure we will, the way the Lords works, but I think you have, you'll have a much easier ride, and actually you'll be able to convince the country of what you're doing in a much, much better way. They've, um, we had the, um, we've seen, re they had recently the illegal immigration bill. Now, they got themselves in an absolute shambles on that because the minister at the time, Lord Murray, and in the end he was sacked because he was so bad, even they sacked him. Um, he just, he got up once and someone said, well, that's a very interesting point. Would the uh, noble Lord um, please write to me about it? And he went, no. <laughs> and, and he went, no, I'm not going to do that. And, and even his own side said, you've got to agree to write them a letter. And he was screaming and shouting and finally going, well, if I have to, I'll write to you then. And he, I mean, that's the, what he, we had. And um, when uh, the government lost the judgment on Rwanda uh, a few weeks ago, I, m I met one conservative member who said, is it wonderful? I'm so pleased they've lost. I said, well, do you know Lord Murray's been sacked? He said, this is a wonderful day. I'm going to go and have a drink now. He said, that man's horrid. And, you know, and that was their own side. So, you know, if just, if just do it properly and actually make your case fairly and actually, actually you know, just ensure you do recognise the procedures, you'll actually get, get a much, much easier ride through Parliament. And um, then we had before Christmas on this, I got on the Rwanda bill, we had the um, government chief whip said to me that this needs to be fast-tracked. And I said, no, we're not going to fast-track it. Oh, it has to be. If the Prime Minister wants to fast track, I said, well, I'm sorry, we're not going to fast track it. It's going to get, you're going to have to go through all the proper procedures. You get every part of it. And if you attempt to fast track it, you'll have to put a motion to do that, and you will lose and lose heavily. And you know that. They backed off then. And then this week, we've had, we had the lecture this week from the Prime Minister. The laws can't interfere with our bills. Well, that's what well, we'll see about that when we get into the bill. Um, <laughs> but it is. It's just, again, just not the way to actually treat the bill or treat Parliament, you know, as I mentioned before. So I um, think, as I said, if, if we're lucky to win the election, I'm lucky to be Government Chief Whip, I certainly intend to do things properly. So I do believe by doing it properly, we can actually more quickly, in a better way, get our policies uh, on the statute. But also, I think, let's be clear, especially since the arrival of Boris Johnson, our international reputation has been ruined, absolutely trashed, all around the world it has, you know absolutely trashed and this country is always seen as a fair decent country worked well and always when it said something its word was his bond and that has gone out the window in recent years and we've got to get that back because i think our country is much better than this and we we, we could do much better things for our own country and also for around the world we get the chance to serve i'll leave it there we've got some great speakers here from i'll, I'll have you answer people's questions later on thank you So I'm going to turn to Kirsty now. Um, I understand earlier this week uh, Labour 
uh, candidates were given a sort of campaigning Bible, which was filled with key messages they were told to get out to voters when they do eventually get contact with them. So I'd love to hear more about the sort of messaging that you're trying to get out there, but also what you believe the priority should be, you know, if Labour does win at the next election. Well, thank you so much for having me. And I think we'd all agree in this room that the Labour Party has one task and one task only in 2024, which is to deliver Keir Starmer a majority, a majority that is deep, that is durable, that is disciplined and that is democratic. And what I mean by deep is, as Roy has mentioned, we have to win, not just turnout, we have to win votes in every, democratic, uh, every demographic and in every part of the UK if we're to have an enduring majority. It must be durable. And what I mean by that is, as soon as we win, if we are lucky enough to do so, we have to be building immediately our base in local government and in the youth movement so that we have the advisors, the politicians, the activists of tomorrow. We've tried to do some of that in Midlothian with a scheme called Labour Launchpad, which is a paid internship. But the reason this is important is because if you think about our missions, each and every one of them is a decadal project. And let's hear no more nonsense about the idea that Labour doesn't have any policy. We have policy coming out of our ears, but more importantly, we have got policies that are worth fighting for. So don't let anybody tell you there's no difference between the parties, because smashing the class ceiling is a fight worth having. Leaving a livable planet to our children is a fight worth having. Making work pay is a fight worth having, but they are not things that can be achieved in only one term. So each and every CLP needs to be thinking about how do we make our majority both big and durable. It must be disciplined, and we should be utterly unapologetic about this. With faith in politics on the floor, the Labour Party should be proud and unapologetic about having the highest standards in its elected representatives. The taxpayer deserves nothing less, and working people certainly do. But it must also be democratic, and this is the main point that I want to focus on, because I have always hated, and therefore we must call a halt to, this distinction that is drawn between pamphlet Labour and leaflet <coughs> Labour. And I say this with all the love in the world. I've been a Fabian as uh, my whole adult life, as long as I've been in the Labour Party, I chair the IPPR, I chair the advisory board of our Scottish Future. I spent Boxing Day, true story, writing something about working men's clubs for the Social Market Foundation. So I am all about ideas, I love them. However, we have to get past this idea that there can, in this day and age, with the complexity of the problems we face and the depth of distrust in politics, that there can be a meaningful separation between the politics of ideas and the politics of organisation, and that those are meaningfully held separately by completely different groups of people. That might have been possible in the last Labour government. It's not going to be possible anymore. So today, welcome to the launch of what I'd like to call Delivery Labour, a political project that is ruthlessly focused on delivering our policy ambitions, but also that is in a permanent campaign because we have to have an agile policy process that means we are in constant touch with our electorate and our voters to see whether the policies we're advancing are really making a difference. Now, as mentioned, and this is where I'll leave you, I just returned yesterday from our friends at PPI, the Progressive Policy Institute and Progressive Britain, took some Labour candidates to the US this week to meet with folks on the Hill and also strategists and grassroots organisers. And the key thing that I've taken away from that is, if we learn nothing from the Biden presidency, let it be this, that you can spend gargantuan amounts of money and make genuine and enduring changes in people's lives, but you will not reap a political dividend for that. And as we look aghast at what might happen in November, we have to take this on board. We will not reap a political dividend for that kind of work as progressives unless we are in constant touch with our electorate. So I would ask us all today to think about how in this year we are going to undertake the work, not just of generating ideas, but getting out there and fighting for them as Fabians. It's long been our obligation, but no more so than this year, because we have to sell the political achievements that I know Keir Starmer is going to deliver in that first 100 days. We have to both sell them, but also secure them, because the other thing that's true about those missions is not only are they decadal, they are whole of society efforts. If you think about ending violence against women, that is not something that can get done by policy diktat or through spending alone. That is requiring men to speak to men and having a different sort of settlement 
about the relationship between the sexes and the genders. If you think about our health ambitions, we cannot have a healthy society that's an unconnected society where people are living lonely lives, where they don't feel part of something bigger than themselves. Each one of our missions is going to require the whole of society to be involved. So by all means, let's have a great debate about ideas today, but let's really focus on building that delivery labour. And if we do so, I think we're not just going to win big. Crucially, we're going to deserve to. Thank you so much. Um, Emma, I'm going to turn to you. So, I'm going to turn to you, Emma, just to get your sort of ideas, as Kirsty was suggesting, the best ways on selling these ideas out on the doorstep over the next few months. Thank you so much, Abena. Uh, sorry, uh, Aletha. I'm getting my, my, my people mixed up. I do apologise. Um, I can't quite match Roy. I've only been a member um, from the 22nd of February next month for 34 years. Um, I, it was a gift from my father on my 15th birthday. He may be in this room. I don't know if he's come to this session. Um, look, policy is incredibly important, um, but it's not what wins elections ultimately um, because... Manifest, well, I mean, it, it, you need to be able to sell your policy, but ultimately, um, manifestos, when we come to publishing the manifesto, uh, Aletha will go through it line by line, trying to work out um, the question, what are you going to do and how are you going to pay for it? Kirsty will memorise every single part of it because she'll be asked about something on each doorstep, and Patrick will pull the hell out of it. Um, but the voters won't read it. And that's the ultimate truth. Um, so what we need is something that is an overarching way of, of making it clear. Because what a manifesto is, is a permission document for government. You have said what you're going to do, and then you have made the vibe clear, the frame clear. So I, uh, as a writer, um, so I would say that my shovel is my pen, <laughs> um, <laughs> would say, I, I offer the Labour Party, and my, frankly, my consultancy rates are very reasonable. <laughs> I offer them this slogan, let's fix Britain. Now, I'm going to talk you through why I've chosen each of those words, and I think it's really, really important. Let's, that's an inclusive word. That's, that's short, a shortening of let us. That's not saying we're going to do it for you. That's saying that we are going to do this together as a nation. And I'm going to come to that nation part, Britain. We are, for the first time uh, in a decade, talking about winning again in Scotland, talking of, about bringing Scottish Labour voters into that coalition and people who will be part of that Labour government uh, will be from all of the nations and regions of Britain, uh, with the exception of Northern Ireland because the Labour Party doesn't stand there, but there will be very important uh, work to be done to make sure that they are part of that coalition too. And fix. Um, can anyone tell me what the Labour Party slogan was in 1997? I bet you'll get this wrong. It's not things can only get better. Everyone thinks it is because of the song. It's actually, I think then they probably chose this after the song became so popular, Britain deserves better. Um, and I think that's really interesting, and it does the same thing I'm trying to do, which is point out the disaster of where we are at the moment. Everything feels shabby, everything feels broken, nothing works in this country. Everything's too expensive and doesn't work. With a positive vision for the future in three words, let's fix Britain. Thank you. Yeah. And Patrick, our polls expert, please uh, take it away. <laughs> Uh, thanks, Aletha. Um, yeah, so um, as, as, as Lord Kennedy said, uh, there are mountains to climb. There are huge mountains to climb for the Labour Party to get into government after the next election. And it's not only about the swings required, but it's about Labour being competitive and winning in places that haven't really looked at Labour since 2005. That's a long time ago. And that's a lot of voters who haven't really trusted what the Labour Party has to offer to bring into the fold, to bring into the electoral coalition. Now, I, uh, I had a very quiet Sunday this uh, last weekend. You might have seen something that came out in the Telegraph. Nobody really made a big fuss about it. You know, it wasn't, wasn't really a big deal. 
Um, but, you know, the fact of the matter is that is where the polls are right now. And even sort of accounting for things like, you know, where were the big raft of people who don't know how they would currently vote, where are they likely to go? Are there likely to be any swings back toward the government? Accounting for these things, reading the polls right now, Labour are on course for a big majority. Now, of course, the election is not happening right now. That MRP is what we call a, a now cast. It's how the polls are now, with a little bit of sort of things here and there, and how does that break down at the constituency level. But the polling right now suggests that Labour is in a good place. But I think three questions are really important. So taking that polling and projecting it forward into what Labour needs to do to win and what they need to do sort of in, in government. Do the British people want Labour to govern? What sort of opportunity to govern will the public give Labour if they do? And how do Labour convince the court of public opinion when they are governing that they are governing successfully? Because day one, if Labour win the next election, is a very different day to the day before the election. And it get a whole different dynamic of public opinion when you're actually governing. So to go to the first question, while it is certainly the case that the public believe that a Labour government under Keir Starmer would do a better job of managing things like the NHS, housing, and yeah, even the economy, which is not something that Labour normally lead on, Keir Starmer typically trails neither on the question of who would make the best Prime Minister, and people are more likely to think that Keir Starmer is not ready to be Prime Minister and the Labour are not ready for government than think that they are. The key thing, though, is, of course, that the Conservatives are in an absolutely diabolical place with public opinion right now. Rishi Sunak's numbers, the Conservative Party numbers, are so far underwater that, by comparison, Starmer and Labour look very rosy. But how much of it, how much of a mandate, how much of a propeller, how much of a force into government is simply being better than the other guys? I think that's a really important and open question. And I think that's important because it might tell us a lot about come election day, when this question of who governs comes on, and perhaps votes get squeezed and the Conservatives might start to recover. What kind of majority, if any, will Labour be left with on the day after election day? And do we start going from talking about a decade of renewal to five years to try and build another go at getting a majority or defending something that's very, very small? And I think that would present a very different set of policy proposals and policy opportunities and things that the Labour government can and can't do, depending on what sort of scenario we actually end up on in the day after the election. And I'll finish very briefly on what I think the things that the voters will be looking for for a Labour government if they do come in. Now, the things that they keep telling us consistently that they want the government to sort out are the cost of living crisis, getting the NHS back onto its feet and getting it functioning again. Yes, they're talking about immigration a lot and getting a grip on immigration. They're talking about delivering net zero by 2050, hugely popular policy. And they're talking about building more housing. But most of all, I think, these things speak about competence. And they speak about a government which is not in their lives every single day, trumpeting this or scandal that. What well, the British public, I think, really are looking for is for a government to come in, get on with the job, not be in their face all the time, and to deliver things that make the country work again. I'm just going to ask one question uh, to the panel before I open it up to the audience. Um, I guess I'll start with you, uh, Lord Kennedy. Um, as sort of Patrick alluded to just there, I mean, a Labour government would inherit a huge mess, a huge mess with not much money to spend in terms of you know, trying to fix things and make things better. Uh, we heard Sadiq Khan earlier this morning uh, sort of saying that he'd be up for giving Rachel Reeves and the team and hoping that you know, the electorate also give the team a chance to sort of fix things before they start really rebuilding and, again, spending money. And he hopes that will happen in the first term. So, I mean, how, like, what's the best way to sort of sell that to the public, especially the people that are just not really convinced, you know, that Labour are competent at this time, but also um, there are many people that are feeling quite apathetic at the moment. I think it is about Labour, you know, as Patrick outlined there, at the moment is, good, is quite good in terms of where we stand. But I think when we're in the election, 
is what he, he's not going to be like 97. There is, the economy wasn't beginning to improve. We're in a much more worse position. I think it is about being competent. I think it's about being honest with people. And it's actually beginning to show where you can make differences. It's about supporting the economy, supporting business and growing the economy, but also where we can. There are many things we can do to actually turn things around uh, straight away. We could look at, I mean, one thing I keep banging on about is that, I mean, um, we could do lots of work on, on, on leasehold reform very early on in the government, in the, in the first few days, actually. It doesn't cost the country a penny, actually. That's one thing I keep going on about. Another thing being, so I think we have to think straight away. We can also look at programmes and change things, but you're absolutely right. We also be honest that the economy is in such a bad way, it's been so badly mismanaged by this present gov government, that it's going to take us time. Be honest about that. Mm -hmm. And don't overpromise the things you can't do. Kirsty, how difficult is it telling voters, you know, this is the reality of things and this is all that we've got to do? So, uh, like, I I'm absolutely love this country and it's extraordinary people, but one of the best things about us is the sort of, like, phlegmatic, sort of stoical um, ability to just get on with things and internalise things as normal, that are not normal and should never be internalised as normal. So it's now taken as read that we have a food bank in every community as if that's a normal part of community infrastructure like a library or a swimming pool it's not it's a disgrace it's an outrage and it didn't used to be like this so the threshold that I need to get over with my electorate is the it's just a base hygiene factor is the belief it doesn't have to be like this and the way that I know it doesn't have to be like this is it did not used to be like this. So helping people reimagine a world that's different before we even get into the individual policies of how different um, public services are going to be funded and reformed, just the very idea that change is possible at all is actually the first threshold to get over. And there is simply no way of doing this. And as I say, this is the thing that's heartbreaking from my conversation in the States. There is no way of convincing people of that other than one-to-one -one by looking them in the eye and having them trust the motivation of your heart. And that does require a huge electoral organising effort from us and actually for that to be permanent. So this idea, and sometimes my members say, oh, I'm really looking forward to uh, helping when the campaign starts. So I'm like, babes, it's been there a year. Like, <laughs> there, there's no point where the campaign starts. And also bad news, there's no point where the campaign ends. It's going to have to be permanent because, and we uh, very much value our uh, relationship with people in the polling and insight industry and folks in, who do creative communications and messaging but the single best message is the one that gets heard. And the only way to make sure people hear your message is to be on their doorstep relaying it to them directly. So we do have to invest in a lot of the communications infrastructure, but in the end, it's your shoe leather that's gonna make sure our messages get heard and that people do start to have that belief again that things can be different. Awesome, thank you. Um, and Patrick, um, you know, when we look at Keir Starmer's, you know, leadership ratings and compared to Rishi Sunak's, obviously he's still ahead, but not by a dramatic lead. Um, we've seen Rishi sort of changed his campaign message since the new year, yeah, once or twice <laughs> in the last few years. He's no longer calling himself sort of a fresh start candidate. He's now, you know, begging people to sort of stick with the plan and mm -hmm. things are going to work out eventually, maybe somehow, in the, over the next five to ten years. And do you think maybe Keir Starmer should be shifting his message at this time to also sort of reflect a change in tone, ramp up of attack maybe on the Tories now? Yeah, that's a good question. I think it's always a delicate balance to strike, isn't it? As Particularly as an opposition, you have that uh, freedom, I guess, to simply criticise everything and say, we would do better because we are better. We don't have anything to sort of prove, you know, they're doing a terrible job. And I think... There's a, a great saying, isn't it, like, don't interrupt your enemy when they're making mistakes. And I think at the, at the minute, Labour's sort of got that position probably about right in terms of they're allowing uh, the, the government to sort of make their errors and make their mistakes and kind of amplifying them and talking about that as much as they can. Uh, there's, there's probably going to become a point, uh, something that voters do tell us quite a lot is they're not sure what Labour stand for and they're not sure what Keir Starmer stands for, which is kind of in contrast to the, 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 the point I don't disagree with at all, that there's policy coming out of ears everywhere, and particularly in, this, in these rooms as well, but it doesn't really transmit to the voters very well at the minute and they're not really getting these messages and not really getting the sense that Labour has no identity, that Labour knows what they want to do when they get into power. And I do think that probably at some point that that has to change if Labour are going to be successful and have kind of a, a big breakthrough election and a big mandate and a, a clear sense of what they want to do. So I do think that has to come probably, but for now, while the government just keeps doing what they're doing, it's probably quite okay to sit back and say, well, we're not those guys. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, just back on messaging, you've obviously uh, lended Labour your suggestions. So if I, if anyone's Very here. reasonable rates. <laughs> <laughs> Um, what's the best way for the party to sort of uh, campaign, perhaps, for a united, a more united kingdom than there is at the moment? I know Fabians has done a lot of research on winning back Scotland from the SNP largely. Um, but what sort of, you know, key message do they be getting out over the next few months in order to, you know, prove that, as uh, Lord Kennedy, I guess, was suggesting earlier, that they are sort of on the same side, it's just that they're not campaigning for independence? So I think there are very different things that um, I, as an East Londoner, um, and people in East Lothian might think about. But when it comes to walking into the ballot box, we're probably both thinking about our gas bill. We're probably both thinking about, I mean, I don't have kids, but I think about the education of my niece and nephew. I think about the fact that I'm knocking on and at some point I might fall over, and will there be a hospital place for me? Um, you know, so I think the key thing is to speak to the whole country and the things that unite us. Um, I think the Tories are going to run a really vicious um, and very, very divisive campaign, and we... Um, we shouldn't fall into the trap of answering those specific questions. Um, you, I mean, we're going to get journalists doing the, what are you going to do on immigration? What are you going to do on um, crime? Frankly, more than you, mate. Um, we'll get the gotcha questions, and we need to have answers. But we need to have answers that say, this is my answer to your very fringe question. Now let's move on and talk about what the voters care about. So it's not, because there will be, um, you know, on each of those issues, there is a percentage of voters that care about them. Now, you probably go down the pecking order. Immigration, I would love it if everyone was as liberal uh, as I am, but they're not, so we need to be able to talk to and answer those voters. Um, but we need to be able to say, we will manage this better than the Tories. As a result of that management, these numbers will come down but we will also be making sure that we have the staffing levels in the NHS to actually provide the care you need. And that is what ultimately matters. Um, and those two things are sometimes in tension with each other, which is why the, the government, since Brexit, have had to have record levels of legal immigration. And yet all the discussion is about small boats. Um, I think it's about bread and butter. Um, without too much jam tomorrow. Um, so just be honest. I, I think, I genuinely think, that if Keir Starmer is talking about having a decade in power, then not having insanely soaring and unsustainable levels of popularity can actually be quite a good thing. Um, if he can get in um, on a, yeah, we think you're probably better than the last lot, mate, ticket, and then deliver a bit, then you're, you haven't got a pedestal to fall off. And we love knocking politicians off pedestals in this country. So those are the things I would say, you know, the steady Starmer, steady as he goes, is probably, and, and quite frankly, it's the most realistic way of maintaining who he is, because he's not going to suddenly turn into, you know, Keir Starmer superstar. So. <laughs> OK, I'm going to open questions up. To, oh, wow, I've got loads wow. of questions. <laughs> <laughs> Um, do we have a mic going around? If not, we have a, a, a standing oh, mic, okay, so great. people on this side will probably be able to reach it. Okay, can I come to the? Can I start at the front? The lady in the blue dress, just right in front of me. She's just here. I think you may need to come up. Yeah, you need to go up for the for the live stream. <laughs> I'm well trained. <laughs> Hi, I'm Emily Hicks and I'm a councillor in London Bridge. One of the things on the doorstep when I'm out every weekend that I feel kind of creeping in and I think will increase this year is misinformation. I spend quite a lot of time correcting people. This was really apparent last summer over you, Les. So I'm just wondering what the panel think will be the impact of misinformation on the 2024 campaign, both for London, but of course for the general election. It was highlighted as one of the top global risks by the World Economic Forum report this week. 
uh, and also how that will impact our governing. And this is misinformation from the Conservative government but, and also from more dubious sources. Thank you. Um, Lord Kennedy? Yeah, I think that's an absolutely vital point you raised there. I mean, there's a huge problem with misinformation. Uh, you people may have seen, uh, you know, some of these, you get these sort of fake videos that actually look real, don't they? You know, and there's one appalling one uh, uh, having a go at Sadiq Khan a few months ago. And I mean, I think we're going to see more and more of this. We, it's been raised in Parliament. The government don't really are bothered about it. You know, they're not that bothered at all, you know. And it is a huge problem. I think we've all got to be able to say this is not true, this is fake. And also we are going to rely on other sections of the media to be absolutely clear this stuff is, is, is lies, it's rubbish, it's intended to deceive people. Uh, it's, we've never seen it before in this country, but I do think the, the, there's a real risk that um, um, fakes and lies and smears will be out the door and accepted the population the truth before we even get, get around to actually confronting that. Uh, we'll keep raising it in Parliament, but there is a, a real lack of interest in the government to do anything much about this. And the Electoral Commission, again, I think been pretty disappointing on it as well, in terms of what, the, what they're doing. They're not doing very much at all. But it's a real threat to our democracy, a real threat to our country, that people can you know, have major lies told about policy or about individuals that will have a, a, a direct effect on how they cast their votes. Patrick? Um, yeah, I think it's certainly something that we're seeing more and more of, as you've sort of very correctly identified. And the, we, the public are concerned about it as well themselves. They're sort of, when you ask them sort of about the deep fake possibilities and sort of what it might lead to, people are very concerned about this sort of individual voter level too. Um, so I guess it could go one of two ways, right? It could go into a, a system where uh, you know, the ecosystem is simply full of all this and nobody knows what the truth is from anything else, or the public could get very wide to it very quickly. And that sort of stuff can happen as well. So I think that probably would require an ecosystem of a lot of very quick fact-checking and a very quick sort of uh, spread of correct information among the sort of uh, uh, those who can control information pathways. But it's certainly something that the public are thinking about. It's certainly something that the public are increasingly aware about when we track it with them. So that perhaps might lead us to a place where they get, they get wise to it. But you know, it's, it's, it's quite a new technology, I think, and a lot of it's very convincing, so we'll have to see. And Kirsty? Yeah, so uh, there, there's certainly policy and regulatory answers, and that will be on those of us if we're lucky enough to be elected to sort. But things that every single person in this room can do today, uh, one is donate to the Centre for Countering Digital Hate, which is doing some of the best work on countering uh, hate and misinformation. So please, any pennies you're not sending to the Labour Party, send their way. The second thing is, for the love of God, stop sharing it. Stop sharing it. Like, progressive people who hate, quote, nonsense, to try and rebut it. All you are doing is amplifying it. Friends don't let friends amplify misinformation. So don't you do it. If you see your MP or your allies in the Labour Party do it, punish them. Like, stop them. Like, we, we are doing a lot of this work for our enemies. It's utterly counterproductive. So, like, please just put a lid in it. Uh, the gentleman with his red card in the <laughs> glasses. <laughs> Do you want the mic? Yeah, you need to get the mic. Thank you. Titus Alexander, Democracy Matters. I just want to pick up Emily. You said about let's all together, and I think it's really important. And I think one of the keys to having a durable Labour government and a victory is people power and participation so that people feel that they own it. Gordon Brown made some very significant recommendations, and I think you can go further than that. And he said we should have a national dialogue about how we do it now so that the government can act immediately. So what are the opportunities to take part in that national dialogue, and where is it to date? Thank you. Lord Kennedy? I think the, the dialogue that he announced, I mean, I think it's, um, he put his report out there and, and, and discussions uh, I think that we need to, the party probably needs to do more in terms of have that discussion and dialogue uh, with, with the country. I think our focus, of course, has been about, you know, as we said here, actually winning the election. So I think maybe we need to do more on that. But I think our focus has up to now been, now, and probably doesn't need to be uh, for the next few months on actually getting us over the line. Uh, so that's probably where I think we've been. And I mean, I was just thinking about, um, I'm going to give you um, three sets of numbers. Um, 124, 91, and 33. Any idea what those numbers mean? Any idea? No? Uh, 
one, two, four was the years we've been informed as a, as a party. 91 years in opposition, about 33 years of government. <laughs> I, I do actually want to start adding to the 33 a bit more, because I do think, you know, that, that we can only ever change lives and put, in, put into practice what we've got in terms of what Gordon wants and other colleagues want to do by actually being in power. And that's the most vital thing for me. Emma, do you want to add to that? Yeah, um, I think there's a lot we can do in terms of the Labour Party to change ourselves um, in the way that we think about our culture of discussion. We are all too often, we're a broadcast party. Now, I've given you a slogan, and I think that that slogan or whatever they end up with that won't be nearly as good... Um, <laughs> It will, be, it will be important to keep pushing that message. Um, I think Peter Mandelson once said that the moment that you're just so pig sick yeah. of saying it, they might just be yeah. hearing it. And that is absolutely true. As a communications professional, I can tell you that's completely, completely the case. But broadcast is not the only way. Um, so we do need to have a dialogue, a real dialogue. Now, that dialogue can be tough because sometimes people will be asking us to do things we're not going to do. Um, and how you say, no, I'm sorry, we're not going to do that to a voter in a democracy is always a complicated question for anyone who is also asking at the same time, but could you also vote for me? Um, but I do think that we need to be um, finding spaces both within the party, but also when we get into government, uh, when, if, sorry, I know we're not going to supposed to do the complacency thing, um, to continue dialogue, to make sure that policy is, yes, absolutely made by organisations like the Fabians, um, you know, that, that kind of important policy wonkery um, is really, really essential, and I, there isn't enough of it within the infrastructure. Um, so I'm very glad that the Fabians exist and that we're doing such good work. But also that there is a sense from the people who would be impacted by, benefit from any of those policies, that they have a stake in that policy making, and, and not just the policy making, but the ongoing policy provision. Because if you just go, oh, well, we've got the policy now, we know what we're going to do, done it, right, move on to the next thing. Um, my, uh, my caution in policy-making communications is always, you think that writing that report's the end of the project. Writing that report's the beginning of the project. And it's how, where that work goes next that's going to make sure that you have dialogue and not just broadcast. Uh, gentlemen... I'm looking at you. <laughs> You've got your black glasses on. Do you want to get up and walk over to the mic if you can? Or should... Uh, thanks very much. Um, Liam Martin Lane, I'm a councillor in Camden. Um, Kirsty, and to an extent, Emma took the words out of my, uh, out of my mouth, really, so I can short circuit this question. Uh, I just remember what Angela Rayner said at a Labour Party conference that the Tories break 99% of their manifesto, yet they shout about the 1% they do deliver. We keep 99% of our manifesto and we shout about the 1% that we don't deliver. And the one thing I don't want is that the election after next is knocking on doors where people are saying, we voted for you last time because we want the Tories out. You haven't done anything, so we'll have the Tories back in, thank you. So how confident are we that not just good local MPs and good local activists, but at the centre of government, if we win next time, we have that proper comms infrastructure to continue to get out those good news stories about what a Labour government is doing and how we are different. Kirsty, do you want to jump? Uh, yeah, so it's a great question. It sort of relates, my answer sort of relates to the one before it as well, which is there is always a tension and there should be a tension between different intellectual currents in the Labour Party. So as well as being a proud Fabian, I'm a cooperative party candidate. And that sort of different tradition of local organisation, community power based is um, a, a very fruitful, I think, when those things are in dialogue with each other. And Gordon's piece of work is absolutely fantastic. Uh, and I really commend it to all of you. I think it's a really thorough, thoughtful piece of work. It does beg the question about why our enthusiasm for devolution is now higher than it was actually when we were in office. And the reason for that actually I think is a completely legitimate one, which is when we came into government in 97, and I was very uh, proud to work for the last Labour government between 2007 and 2010, 
because the Tories had absolutely decimated public services, the need for that Fabian tradition of centralisation and statecraft to come to the fore was so that we didn't have a postcode lottery. So actually, we were doing kind of levelling up well in advance of it becoming a freeze, and that was the right set of tools for the political task in front of us then. And it may be that the right set of tools for the political task in front of us, if we do come in and inherit uh, this appalling economy, is we might need to do some of that front-loading and centralisation, again, just to get public services off their knees, but the fact that it is Gordon that's done this piece of work and it is so thoughtful, and my understanding is it's been so deeply internalised by Keir and others in the shadow cabinet, I think that um, rejuvenation of local democracy and local activism is going to serve us very well, but we will always have to hold these two traditions in balance because they've got so much to contribute, and I get really nervous when one of our Labour Party traditions says it has all of the answers because that has never been true in my experience, but it's certainly not true in an environment as complicated as the one we're facing. No. Lord Kennedy? Yep, uh, I agree entirely with the point she's made there. But I think we've all got a responsibility for that. You know, we should be really proud of the last Labour government, what it achieved, really, really proud of it. And if we don't shout about how proud we are, no one else is going to talk about it. We won't get in the Daily Mail how great the Labour government was, you know. But and we do sometimes, as a party, uh, get ourselves in a situation where we do all shout about the one thing we haven't done and just forget about the other things we have done. And we've, we will learn one lesson from being in, in opposition these last 13 years, is speak up for what we've done well. We, we're a, we've done some great things as a party in government. You can look at all the Labour governments that they've done in their office, and we should stand up and defend them. And maybe sometimes don't go on about the one thing we haven't done. As Kirsty says, no one part of all the answers, but together we can actually make real difference to people's lives. And our last government did, as did the Wilson government, as did the Attlee government. Um, trying to go further backwards. The gentleman, you're wearing like a puffer jacket. Yes, you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, hi, I'm Lakshan Selden. I'm a Fabian member and a Labour and Cooperative Party in the London Borough of Greenwich. Um, We've talked a lot about reaching out to the electorate, but one of the points made earlier was that we actually make our inroads through shoe leather, and that is actually our membership and our activists. I'd like to ask a question about uh, what we can be doing more to actually engage with our activists and keep them involved in getting them out. I speak from a particular point of view, and that in the last three months, I've actually had three resignations of three of my key activists, uh, and these are the people who, between 10 of us, managed to hit 3,000 doors before 10 o'clock and move along to another key ward. Thank you. Lord Kennedy. Um, what we need to do is, is, is to keep talking to our members. Again, I, I knock on doors uh, every week, I do as well, you know, and I have done since I joined the Labour Party, you know, where they live when I lived in London, when I lived in Southwark, when I lived in the Midlands, where I now live on, on, on the South Coast. You know, so it's got to keep talking to our members, involving our members, engaging our members at every opportunity. It's absolutely vital. And of course, it's responsible for people like myself or people who work in local government to get that engaged activists as well. So I think it's about talking, engaging, and being seen and being out and about and doing, things, doing events like this, knocking on doors and being around. And not, never letting the party, within the council, the party in parliament, the party in government, get away from the membership. Because when you do do that, that's when you get, you get problems and people get angry and irritated. And then maybe then things, they, get, they misunderstand stuff. And we then as a party begin to fall apart. Emma. So here's the thing. Members of any political party are weird. <laughs> <laughs> we are at most 1% to 2% of the entire country. We are people who have actively chosen to spend our Saturday in Jan a freezing cold January in a room like this having a discussion like this. Now that's great, I'm loving it because I'm weird. I'm weird too, I get it. But we have to remember that a party that only pleases its activists is going to be out of step with the country. A party that only pisses off its activists is not gonna get the people to step out on the doorsteps. We as activists, and I proudly count myself amongst that number, have a responsibility to understand that we won't get everything we want. It's just never gonna happen. Yeah, I might be massively enthused by 80% of a manifesto and find 20% of it abhorrent, 
And as a collectivist and a believer in collective socialism, that's okay. That's, you know, that's how it works. Um, that's how democracy works. Nobody gets the exact government or the exact party that they, that they want. There will be things that you might think, no, that for me is a red line over which I cannot cross. I absolutely understand that. I've had moments in my 33.11 um, years of membership of the Labour Party where I've come very, very close to that line. Um, I decided to stay in and fight for what I did believe in. But I think it's really incumbent on the larger group, which is the activist and members, to have an understanding of their relationship and, their, and the ability of that smaller group to represent them whilst also representing the much larger group that is the electorate. Kirsty. Uh, so we actually won a prize for this in Midlothian, a Labour Party best practice uh, prize for member mobilisation last year. So uh, we have credentials that if you come, we will show you a fantastically good time. Uh, so feel free to come and campaign in Midlothian. And we have three mottos about how we do member mobilisation. So one is build leaders. So we train every time, constantly reaffirming people's ability and capacities to do this themselves. But we build leadership um, very deliberately uh, and with huge focus. We test everything so that people, if they give us money or their time, both of which is incredibly precious, that they know that their time has been optimised to the greatest effect because we test everything and we're rigorously scientific about our campaigning. And our third motto is make it fun. So we've done things like knock and talk, where instead of having a speaker come and speak to a CLP meeting in a room, it's our speaker will come on the doors with us and you get to ask them questions as you go around. We did things like the Great Midlothian Doorstep Draw, so instead of having to buy tickets for a raffle, you earned tickets for a raffle uh, by participating, and then we got you tickets for various things that were happening at the Edinburgh Festival and so on. So we really focus on valuing people and making it a fun and an enjoyable, joyful sort of experience for them. The thing that lies behind those three mottos, the thing that's upstream of all of them, and again, this is something that all of you can do today, is a mindset shift from instead of thinking, I am making an ask, you need to think that you're making an offer. Because when you say to people, would you like to come and participate in a campaign that will create a labour gain in Midlothian, what you're actually saying to people is, lucky you, you have been selected for a chance to change lives and change the world. And as soon as you get it into your head that you are actually spreading something unbelievably joyful and meaningful to people, you'll stop feeling so guilty and they'll stop receiving your asks as things that they don't really want to do. So we should all feel proud to be Labour members and activists because that actually is our offer to people. I say these missions are all worth fighting for and if you make the shift to thinking that you are the gatekeeper to an extraordinary world-changing experience we will change things for the better and forever, your members will come out without you asking. Can I take two more questions? Two more. Uh, the lady at the front and the lady with the glasses. Hi, my name is Latika Burke. I'm a journalist. Um, based on the Australian experience, I, I just want to pick up on some of the themes you've been talking about here. They had a government that campaigned on a very micro-target strategy. They got into government just. Sounds a bit familiar. And now, uh, 18 months on, one of the problems they've got is they didn't ask permission to do a lot of reform. And so they can't. And so they're actually looking at a much shorter-term government to go to your point about staying in power once you've gotten into power. So I wanted to ask you about this kind of attack line we're seeing from the Tories about the lack of plan from Keir Starmer and how worried you might, might be that that will resonate if you continue to have this very small target strategy. And I totally get it, you haven't been in government for so long, but there's a risk to that strategy too, isn't there? Hello, I'm Frances Rehal from Faversham. My first kind of observation is, um, I've worked in Sure Start. I developed the first Sure Start program in Kent, and I have got, I suppose, insight into what local people think about things and how people think because I was in the program for so long. And I think we should really think as a party about uh, about you know the last government in 2010 
left a note to say there's no money left. We should say that the Tories could, you could say from the Tories, there's no money left in our pockets. And that will resonate with many, many people who are struggling with the cost of living crisis. My other request is for Schuster, for Labour and for Keir Starmer to come out and say, we're going to fund Sure Start. Because this was a great, great Labour Party policy. It changed lives. It was fantastic. And that would give a message to the people that actually we're going to have change with this Labour government. The other thing I'd like to say is about the the health of children. Now we hear that six out of 10 admissions to hospital for children is with tooth decay. Yeah, Margaret Thatcher took away the milk and the calcium. I mean, should we as a labor government be saying, we are going to bring back milk for children? Okay, thank you so much. We're running out of time, so I just want to give at least Lord Kennedy a chance to answer the two of those. Yeah, a couple, I think we're, we're, I'm going to get everybody in. A couple of points. I mean, I, I, I take the point you say, say then. I actually was in Australia this summer of us, or our summer, so, you know, uh, and uh, I saw some of the, the work the government are doing. I think it, this your question, I answered the question of the colleague there about Shore Star. We've just got to be very careful that we're not seen to be making pledges or things where anyway we, we can't fund those and that's the, that's the problem we've got and it's very difficult um, if you may remember in 1997 we, we announced we were, we were going to keep to the Tory spending plans people were furious but it had to be said because they're not as I said the problem we've got of course is that people think we're oh, they're great ideas but they're going to actually going to tax us here and we'll, we'll be worse off so it's really important that we don't fall into a trap or making promises and pledges, no matter how important they are, that we then throw back at us. We haven't got, we can't fund them. We're going to cost you more money, make the situation worse. All Labour governments, think of the last Labour government, did much, much more in office than actually promised that 1997 manifesto. If you look at the pledge card we had then, they're actually very modest pledges. They were. It did, we did much more than that, but they're all fully costed and could be fully deliverable. And because we could, could be in the trust, we could do, then do more in office. Okay, thank you so much. We've completely run over, so apologies for that. It's been a very exciting session, um, and it's going to be an exciting year ahead. Thank you again.